Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Pinkham, and I'm the Exhibition and Engagement Coordinator for the Main Library Gallery at the University of Iowa Libraries. Because today's event comes to you from Iowa City, I would like to take a moment to show gratitude and respect to the Iowa, Meskwaki, and Sauk Nations and all other Indigenous peoples who have inhabited this place. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today to learn about the Spring 2023 Gallery Exhibit, out and About, Queer Life in Iowa City, which was curated by Maddie Hoberg with Aidan Bettine. For those who haven't had a chance to visit, the main library gallery is located on the first floor of the main library. We produce a new exhibit each semester in which guest curators use storytelling and our archives and our materials at the UI libraries to share an area of their expertise with our community. Out and About Queer Life in Iowa City will close in the gallery on June 30th this year, but you can also check out the virtual tour for this and other recent exhibits on the gallery website at any time, as well as which exhibits and events are coming up next. So make sure to check that out. Today's talk is presented by Maddie Hoberg, one of Out and About's curators, and Maddie will talk a little bit today about her goals for the exhibit, walk us through topics covered, and share about some personal favorite items. And while we know not every organization or important figure in Iowa City's rich LGBTQ plus history is represented in the exhibit, we do hope this sampling will inspire you to learn a little bit more for yourselves. So Maddie Hoberg whose pronoun, pronouns are she, they, is the library's annex assistant at the University of Iowa Library's off-site library storage facility. She's worked at the, uh, the facility since its opening in 2016. In addition to this work, Maddie recently completed an appointment as the volunteer interim executive director and the archives coordinator at the LGBTQ Iowa Archives and Library, which is a nonprofit community lending library and archives right here in Iowa City. Maddie received her Master of Library and Information Science degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison High School in December of 2021, and she participates in several committees at the libraries and on campus relating to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. Maddie began this exhibit project back in 2020 when she submitted her proposal and received the green light from our gallery advisory team, so we're very excited to have her exhibit in the gallery. Uh, Maddie will have some time for questions after her talk, but feel free to throw things in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will get to those at the end. Welcome, Maddie. All right. Hello. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. I appreciate it. Uh, so like Sarah said, we'll kind of go over sort of where this all started from, what the goals of the exhibit were or are, and um, then do a like sort of a quick virtual tour and talk about specific items as we go. Um, if I can get my clicker, there we go. Okay, so this is the origin story. Like Sarah said, I submitted the um, application for or this, uh, the proposal for the gallery before COVID shut down. Um, it was when I was in uh, grad school and had taken a class about museum curation and was like, oh, this could be a fun place to like try and do something different um, and tell stories that I cared about um, and, and to really get a chance to in-depth explore the holdings that we have at, at the UI libraries and in Iowa City. So the hope was and is um, that this is an opportunity to introduce people who may not um, who may be coming to the University of Iowa that may not have any sense of queer history or any context for it. Um, but we do obviously in Iowa, like we have some people coming from rural places where they may not feel like they know a gay person necessarily, right? And they, I mean, we've talked, to, I've talked to students who are in like high school that don't know like what the Stonewall riots are, right? So this was a hopefully, hopefully a chance to talk about some of that history um, and provide that context, both on a national scale and then kind of through the an Iowa City lens, um, using our archival materials to, to locate it near us. Um, we also wanted to really celebrate like the lives of queer people, um, both mundane kind of day-to-day -day stuff and the like amazing communities and, and artistic endeavors that they take on. Um, we wanted to bring a lot of joy forward in the topic that can be kind of heavy sometimes. Um, as an academic library, and when I was in school, I noticed this, and as an employee, I've noticed this, is that there tends to be 
um, kind of a divide between people who are affiliated with the university and people who are like townies, right? So I was hoping that this exhibit would be an opportunity to sort of bridge that gap, um, to talk about how queer life has existed both at the U University of Iowa and in Iowa City for a long time and will, I mean, be going on forever. Um, we also had a wealth of repositories, which I'll touch on in a little bit. Um, we wanted to showcase materials from those things um, or those places as showing different like approaches to collecting materials and curating materials. And again, when I was in grad school, was like looking at stuff and realizing that there's um, there are a lot of archival gaps that are uh, it's a problem across all archives and especially academic archives. And so we were, so, you know, I was thinking, I was like, okay, there's not a ton of like queer there, and there really isn't like in a lot of archives, there's not a lot of queer voices or trans voices in particular, uh, not a lot of voice of materials of and about um, people of color and BIPOC communities. And so I was like wanting a way to talk about why those conversations or why those um, gaps exist and how we can try to remedy it um, with the hopes that this gallery would help us build relationships with people, talk about ways that they can preserve their history, the importance of preserving their history, and to put, hopefully add um, increased diversity in our, in our holdings in the various repositories. So now, if I can again find my clicker, there we go. So we took from several places for this, which is really exciting. Um, we got to take stuff from in-house, so to speak, at the university. So Iowa Women's Archives is probably, the, I think, our biggest contributing repository, or IWA. Um, they have a wealth of material about le uh, lesbian issues and topics and activists, et cetera. The university archives, uh, just in general, has a lot of materials about student organizations, things like that. Um, and the special collections as well, right, is part part of that. And then we also had, uh, there's a local um, community base, like uh, Sarah mentioned, I was the executive, I was interim executive director and archives coordinator for the LGBTQ Iowa Archives and Library. I'm going to call it Lyle because it's a lot easier to get out, it's a lot less lengthy. So um, Lyle had some materials, it's a community archive, so it is a different kind of uh, function and ethos than a, an academic institution. Um, and so we wanted to showcase the materials of, uh, that were coming from that repository as well. And we also were graciously gifted with um, con con uh, uh, items contributed by community members um, where we were seeing gaps or we knew we wanted certain items and we knew people who were involved in various organizations or work. And they um, very generously let us use um, some of their items for this exhibit to help round it out, uh, which is really amazing. So they're not like officially stored anywhere yet, but they um, are things that we were allowed to take for this. Okay, so in the space of the gallery, there's kind of, I would say about, there's like three sections or themes sort of. So the first one is, looking at queer life on campus. So it's mainly University of Iowa affiliate, or it's all University of Iowa affiliated organizations and folks. Then there's kind of a, a history review where we go over like national uh, milestones and things like that. And then there's like uh, Iowa City community more broadly. So it's not necessarily strictly associated with the University of Iowa. Um, so I'll be going through those three sections. And this is the first one, which is uh, life on campus, queer life on campus. So student orgs, we kind of start the exhibit in um, basically 1970. So it's not, the exhibit itself isn't strictly chronological, but this kind of is a good starting point for when um, queer student activism really started happening on campus and getting recognized. So Gay Liberation Front was founded in 1970. It was direct response to the Stonewall riots in New York City. Um, which was an uprising that occurred to protest police brutality that was facing uh, queer people of color and particularly trans and um, trans trans women and drag queens, um, gender nonconforming folks of various types. They're facing a lot of um, intense uh, aggression, and so there was a like a riot, and it was it's seen as like a kind of cornerstone of 
the gay rights movement, right? Like that's kind of the spark point. So Gay Liberation Front chapters started uh, popping up all over the US and Iowa City got one of them. And a student organization was built. It is the first university recognized gay organization in the Midwest. Um, so that's like kind of a good claim to fame. And this organization, what's nice is that this organization as like a starting point um, shows kind of an evolution of student activism and perceptions around queer and LGBTQ issues um, over many, many years. So the, the same group has been in, um, has been in operation and been functional since 1970. So up until today, it's gone through various iterations, um, Spectrum UI, um, Libtow, which is gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, and allies union, um, gay people's union, things like that. So basically as more identities started getting um, included under like the LGBTQ umbrella, they expanded and changed the name to try to, um, to, try to replicate that or, or reflect that so that it wasn't, um, it wasn't focused strictly on gay men um, and it was more inclusive. So, that has kind of snaked its way through history. And now the current iteration of it is called Queer Liberation Front, which is to pay homage to the kind of radical roots of Gay Liberation Front, right? Which was this intense um, movement to stand up for gay rights and um, using the term queer as kind of that umbrella term versus like LGBTQ or LGBTQIA. Um, they still meet in the, the Pride Alliance Center. Um, so if folks are on campus and interested in that, they still have meetings. And oh, and up here too, I'll say too, this is like, I love this image. It's very classic. So this was at a homecoming parade in 1970. And this is the Gay Liberation, um, with Gay Liberation Front float. Um, so you can see like the signs that they have, the out of the closet kind of sentiment. Um, and they have like an another sign that you see in a different picture that's like the anti-homecoming queen, right? So it's it's very fun. It was it's heartening to see this kind of activism from you know 50 years ago, um, and that that's still continuing today. Okay, then we have Group OLL is another student organization that functioned for a few years in the mid 90s. Um, what's interesting about this group is that it was specifically set up to address the intersectional needs of people who are both are part of both the LGBTQ community and who are part of the Latinx community. Um, so Latino, Latino, Latinx, right? Um, there's obviously like, when you talk about intersectionality, we're talking about many different types of aspects of our identities coming together and that um, there's going to be different kind of rubbing points and different areas of oppression and even different areas of privilege, right? Depending on the, the axis of identities at which you, you exist. And so this was meant to address those specific needs, uh, both racial and gender and sexuality um, experiences of people within those communities. And they met at the um, at LNAC, the Latino Native American Cultural Center um, for the years that they were in operation. And you can see here a couple pictures of them in the um, Iowa City Pride Parade. I think the one on the left is them sitting on College Green. So if you've ever, seen a pride or been in a pride um, in Iowa City, that's usually the starting point. And so it's very cool. Lots of good 90s fashion there. The next uh, set of student organizations that we touch on is uh, Greek Works. So we do have a uh, queer social fraternity and a queer social sorority. So the fraternity is Delta Lambda Phi um, and they have, um, it's for queer and trans men um, or gender non-conforming people. And the same goes but with just like basically lesbian women, trans women, et cetera, for the sorority. So we were lucky enough to be able to get, uh, what's excites me about this is we were able to get first images given to us by Gamma Rho Lambda, which is really gracious of them um, and able to see some, uh, some cool images of them since they were founded in 2015. Um, but then we also, I was able to talk to a peer whose name is Quinn and they work at the University of Iowa in the libraries as well. And they had been, they had participated in both Delta Lambda Phi 
and gamma rho lambda, which is a really, really interesting access for or act, a really interesting position for them to occupy, right? To have experience in both of the organizations. And they had a paddle um, from, Delta, uh, from gamma rho lambda that they were like, hey, I think this would be interesting for you to use. And we knew we wanted a paddle. Um, so that's one of our like community contributed um, items. And that makes me really like excited. And Quinn's story and their reflections on their experiences is really, is really cool and interesting and complicated. And um, if you ever get, a, if you ever run into Quinn, you should ask them about it. But it's is very cool. I was very very glad to be able to include the paddle. Okay, and then the last of the like intent, like the student focused organization include UI Trans Alliance, which is also still in operation today. Again, they meet at the Pride of Leiden Center, I believe once a month or every other week, something like that. Um, you can look it up on the Pride Alliance Center's um, calendar. But uh, UI Trans Alliance, which is advocating for trans folks on campus, staff, students, and faculty, et cetera. The Outlaws, which is one example from the College of Law in this case of a LGBTQ uh, organization that is focused around specific professions. There's this, there's equivalents with like health sciences and things like that as well on campus and, and historically have been. Um, the Outlaws is just one that we highlighted here. And then the last one is the Mirage, which is an event that happens every December in, um, in sorry, uh, in conjunction with AIDS uh, World AIDS Awareness Day, basically. Um, and it's a time when they talk about safe sex and um, sexual health for folks. And there's usually a drag show and other fun, fun celebrations and things like that that go on. So, and you can see over here, we have, this is from the, this is from Lyle on the left. Um, there's this cool sign that another library person, Olivia Anderson made, um, that is shaped at, is cut out into the shape of Iowa and it says trans power. And so that was used at a uh, trans day of uh, visibility in uh, a couple of years ago, I think 2021. So that's that's a fun one to, um, to showcase. And again, speaks kind of reflects back on the gay liberation front signs, right? Like this kind of history of protests that exists around LGBTQ uh, fight for equity. And at the end of the University of Iowa kind of section, we sort of evolved from student organizations into more um, staff, faculty, and campus-wide uh, resources and, and, and institutions. So we have uh, panels about the Rainbow Graduation, which has been going on for, I think, since the early, to, early to mid 2000s. Um, and they, uh, it's put on by the LGBTQ plus council, which was the um, LGBTQ staff and faculty um, organization, I think it was the association. And so um, they help put that on as a way to recognize students, their allies, their mentors, et cetera, when they're graduating. And another community contributed item is from from the rainbow graduation ceremony. So we were given uh, rainbow and trans graduation cords um, that are available for people who participate in the ceremony. And that was from Danielle Martinez uh, who works on campus and uh, is a local Iowa City person. Um, so those are kind of those two together. And then there's also the Pride Alliance Center or it's called the Pride House, which is up by the other cultural research, uh, cultural centers um, on the west side of campus. Uh, near like LNAC and Africa House and um, a the APAC Center. So those are kind of the like main institutions. We also, as part of this exhibit, had sort of like breakout spotlights. Um, and for the campus side of things, we chose to look at Rusty Barcelo and her materials. She has a lot of like really great stuff. She was a, um, she's a, a Chicana lesbian and she came out publicly in, at Pride in 1991 and uh, was at that point the highest ranked university official who was out. Um, and so that was a really powerful, um, powerful movement, powerful statement. Again, like this kind of, you know, to, she speaks to, and we have a little quote about it, like that's kind of her coming into like her whole self 
publicly, right? And it, and that speaks to that kind of intersectional identity and how hard it can be to navigate those kind of multiple worlds um, and create friction. But if you're interested in her her papers, she's got some very, very good stuff in her collections at the University Archives. The other uh, campus resource that we focused on or had a spotlight of was the LGBTQ clinic, which has been in operation for, well, I mean, I think getting close to a decade now, um, but it was started by Katie and Borick and our Dr. Katie and Borick and Dr. Colt Nisley. Um, and they, uh, Dr. Nisley just retired recently, um, but uh, Katie and Borick is still working at the LGBTQ center or LGBTQ clinic, excuse me. And um, they provide gender affirming care of all different sorts for people. So that could include like uh, surgery uh, referrals, uh, hormone therapy, hormone replacement therapy, um, or even just being able to go for like a gynecological check with someone who's affirming of your gender um, and or getting, you know, cold medicine or anything like that. If you're, you're worried that you have an infection and need an antibiotic, they offer those kinds of uh, primary care services as well um, in an in a affirming and safe space. Okay, so that's the end of kind of the first chunk. I'm like mo motioning because I'm thinking of the room. Um, so that's kind of the end of the university, the strictly university side of things. So then we have these kind of milestones that we go over as sort of a educational and historical context. Um, so what we tried to do with each, each of these things that are listed in the bullets are different events or um, historical moments that speak to LGBTQ history specifically um, and have, a, have an ongoing impact in what we do. And so with each kind of panel, it's, each one has its own panel. And we tried to talk about like the general history of the event, where it came from. So usually that's within a national scope. And then we talk about the kind of manifestation within Iowa City or in Iowa. And um, so we have the Pride and Stonewall Uprising, which I talked about briefly. Um, we have a picture of Sylvia Rivera, who's a true icon. She's amazing. Um, uh, but she was one of the people that was involved in starting the Stonewall Uprising. Um, it was an I mean, it was an intense protest. It was like a battle with the police basically um, because of the bigoted prosecution that the, the community was facing uh, at the Stonewall Inn, which was a gay bar uh, in New York City. And since that like initial riot, that kind of like in June, basically, because it was in June of 69, um, since that time, that that month has kind of become the standing pride month right so it's a, it's meant to pay homage to um, that origin of what's seen as by many the start of the fight for lgbtq rights and equality then we talk about a bit, a bit about march on washington um and specifically one in 1987 i believe um i think that's the date i get i, I will say this that i have major pregnancy brain happening. So dates may be a little skewed, so forgive me for that. Um, but it was a, a March on Washington in which there was a lot of, there was a huge turnout and people from all sorts, all states, including from Iowa. Um, and there was an intense focus on the need for support and research and education around AIDS uh, as the height of the AIDS or the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, at which point there was not uh, really governmental recognition that it was an issue because it was mainly affecting um, gay men and people of color. And so it was hard, it was kind of ignored. So this was where ACT UP first gained re national recognition. This was the, the Smart John Washington was the first public display of the AIDS Memorial Quilt, um, which is the next one on the line. So the AIDS Memorial Quilt is a, a large installation art exhibit basically where folks can create our folks would create uh, roughly coffin sized panels of fabric that they would attach items to that paid tribute to someone who died from complications of AIDS. And um, they laid them out sort of like a big cemetery essentially, right? To show the scope of the death that was happening within the, the gay community from AIDS um, as, a, as a way to show the immensity of the impact 
Um, so that's a really intense one. The, um, we still do, a, there's usually a reading of the names uh, day on campus at the university. Um, and the AIDS quilt has come to Iowa before. So it's, it's a very like intense, large scale project. Um, if you are not familiar with AIDS history, I would suggest that you look into it. It's, it's troubling, but it's, I mean, it's still something that it's, it's very important to note that history. Um, the next ones we have are sort of more uh, like advocacy, kind of like proactive sort of thing. So we have National Coming Out Day and we have a little article on the bottom there from the Daily Iowan about National Coming Out Day, which is a chance for people to come out um, as gay, trans, whatever identity they fall in within the community um, as a way to try to humanize queerness. So when people say like, I don't know a gay person, National Coming Out Day was an opportunity to be like, no, I'm actually a member of your, I'm your friend circle or somebody you love in your family and I'm part of this, right? So it's a way to kind of um, make concrete queerness and queer life and queer joy, right? Like, in, and to celebrate, um, celebrate people who are able to safely come out. It has been kind of complicated because of that safety issue for people within certain contexts and, and social spaces. Um, so it's not necessarily for everybody, but, and it's usually an iterative project, uh, process of coming out. Um, but this is just an opportunity, uh, a welcome, like kind of open door opportunity for people to disclose. Then we have the National Day of Silence, which is a largely student-led um, a student-led protest, essentially, uh, where students of all sorts of grades and ages will uh, commit to a day of silence where they will not speak during the day, as particularly in class, and it's to raise awareness around anti-LGBTQ bullying in schools. And I remember some people doing it in my high school when I was growing when I was growing up in Arizona, and it was not well received by administration. <laughs> and uh, so it can create quite a ruckus depending on where you are. Um, but it is to basically imitate the kind of uh, compression of, of student LGBTQ student voices within uh, academic spheres. Um, the, the next one we have, which just happened a couple of days ago, is the Transgender Day of Visibility. Um, and that's a chance for people to, um, especially for people specifically in the trans community and who are uh, non-binary or gender non-conforming to come forward, share their struggles, share their grievances, and also to celebrate their perseverance, right? And to, and to celebrate what they have going for them and the, their joy in their lives. Um, so that's a, another way, similar to National Coming Out Day to kind of humanize it, right? And, and make it more, um, so you, you put a face to an issue. Um, so that's kind of the Transgender Day of Visibility. And then the last one we touched on in the national scope of things is marriage equality. So, um, this one is really, this is probably one of my favorite panels is uh, we have, you know, we talk about like the Defense of Marriage Act DOMA and how that was really restrictive for a long time for people who were seeking marriage licenses who are the same sex. Um, and it, and the, how that was overturned. Iowa was actually the third state to um, grant state right, uh, uh, states rights protection for same-sex marriage or marriage for people regardless of what the uh, sex was of the two partners. Um, and so that was in 2008, I believe. And then uh, the Supreme Court obviously um, over, uh, obviously came to the conclusion that it was unconstitutional to bar that right. And so that was fully uh, federally, federally guaranteed. Uh, at a later date. What I think is interesting, what I love about this is that there's actually, we have some materials from Lyle that's uh, from Tracy Yorgum, who uh, was a man who him and Ken Bunch, who's also a favorite of mine, uh, went to the courthouse. They're just friends. They weren't even in a romantic relationship. They just went to the courthouse to try to get a marriage license. Uh, there had been similar moves to do this in other states and in Minnesota, I think was the more recent one in this context. Um, but in 1976, they went to the courthouse in Johnson County, applied for a marriage license, got denied, right? But then it kind of scaled, like the ACLU picked it, or the Iowa's chapter of the ACLU um, picked it up and pushed for it. And so it was a, this instance of really early 
advocacy and activism around marriage equality, which I feel like I heard a lot more about in like the 2000s and the in the 90s. And so to see this kind of really early instance of it and in Iowa City is really, really cool and kind of brings into focus the, the from the national scope down to the um, local context. So that's that's a fun one. Okay, and so that's the national stuff, history. Um, and if there are questions about it later at the end, I can I can address those questions. I know it's a I live so much in queer history that um, I forget sometimes that people don't just live in queer history all the time. Uh, so if you have questions about that, feel free to um, put them in the chat and I can address those later to provide more context. Okay, so then we go to the like kind of broader Iowa City um, side of LGBTQ history within our area. Um, and this is not necessarily strictly university affiliated. Um, there's general, there, as with anything, there's usually crossover, right? But like, it, this is uh, less affiliated uh, officially. Um, okay, so the first organization that we highlight is the Grace and Ruby's Women's Restaurant, which was in uh, operation from 1976 to 78. It was founded by Lesbian Alliance, which I'll talk about later, um, but they were um, a lesbian group in Iowa City who, um, tried to focus a lot on women's rights and, and queer women's rights. So they were at that, that again, that intersection of like lesbian activism and feminist activism and like women's rights. Um, and this was a, a place where it was for women only. Uh, there was some um, hubbub, I guess, about it um, because of that. Uh, there was concern about like discrimination basically because it was women's only space. Um, and they were, because of that kind of controversy. They were only in operation for a couple of years, um, but they tried to serve that population specifically. Uh, we have here like a little like pass card for it. Like you have a little ID sort of thing. And so um, it's really cool. I think, I think this is the one. I think Sarah told me that it's a, where Bricks is now, right? So that's a fun fact. I'd have to look it up on the map, but um, yeah, that's just like if you're trying to like think of where it was in Iowa City, that's kind of where it is. Uh, the next organization that we have, a business rather, is Ruby's Pearl, which was an operation from the early to mid 2000s, and it's a feminist sex toy shop. Um, so they did um, a lot of advocacy around LGBTQ issues. With there are some pictures in our archives of them participating in pride parades. Um, the owners are queer which is great. Um, and we love a queer owned shop. And especially with this, right, where there's a celebration of bodies, regardless of what kind of body it is, uh, sexuality and desire, regardless of what, you know, as long as it ain't hurting anybody, everybody's consenting, like you good, right? So this is a space and a chance to talk about how to have sex and experience joy and pleasure in a positive way and in a safe way, uh, which I think is really important as well. And this is like one of my one of my favorite items in the exhibit is there's this little like coupon basically or uh, a gift certificate that says don't forget your daddy and um, it's we all I mean the peach emoji aspect of this is beautiful the rosebud on the top of the peach is beautiful it's all just like so so fun and just celebratory and like tongue-in-cheek and it's really really I really love it it cracks me up every time so um I think that kind of uh, embodies a lot of Ruby's Pearl and, and Iowa Women's Archives does have a pretty good amount of materials from their, uh, their papers. It was pretty hard. <laughs> this one was pretty hard to pull down what we wanted to include. So um, if you get a chance to look at that too, I would, I would highly suggest it. And one of the uh, owners, uh, Kimberly Coaster, I think that's how you say her last name, um, still does stuff at Public Space Long. So she's still in town too, which is great. And then the one of the community organizations that we have that's separate from business stuff specifically is the Iowa City Kings um, or IC Kings. So they've been in uh, existence for over a decade uh, since 2009. And what I really love about this is we got like a wealth of materials from Sarah Tate, who does a lot of their promotional materials and has for a long time. And is a community member. So she, she gifted us with for this exhibit, 
a lot of digital items and digital materials as well as like old merch and things like that, which is really cool. Um, and what I think was really special for me is that with the spot, like basically for the, the way that we did the uh, university spotlight kind of things with the Barcelo and uh, LGBT clinic, we have community spotlights. And so the IC Kings is one of those. And we were able to reach out to Kings from the troop past and present to have them give a quote about what the troop meant for them and, and what that, the kind of impact that it had on men, the kind of impact they see in the community from it and things like that. Um, and they're still active members. They usually, a few of them will perform at Pride. Varla, who's like the MC of the IC Kings, um, performs with Body Body Haha, ha, which is a local queer um, burlesque troupe as well. Um, so they have a very rich history because we had like a wealth of materials. We were able to include a lot of, of context with it. And, and from that kind of group level down to that individual level, which was really it's really powerful and it's fun to see, you know, fun to see the Kings and all their different varieties and sorts and, and what it means to them to be able to perform in a troop like this. Um, to continue on with organizations, we have Lyle stuff, which I've talked about before is, and, and Sarah mentioned at the very beginning in the introduction is a lending library and local community archives. Uh, we have a picture here of them in the Pride, uh, Pride Parade from 2022. And, um, excuse me, and so that kind of is a good, they've been, it's, they just went, Lyle just had its two year anniversary. So it's a relatively new organization, right? But it is doing um, a lot of advocacy offers um, support groups and things like that uh, for, and community meeting space um, at the Close House, uh, which is owned by Public Space One. Then we also have materials from the Lambda Softball Association, and what's cool about that is we got a jersey from Ann Kreitman, who's the associate director of Lyle. And, um, but what's cool is we were able to kind of juxtapose that with other materials within the University of Iowa collection. So that includes the RAC, RATS jersey. I feel like uh, softball is like one of the, softball and kickball are one of those sports that a lot of times you'll see like queer leagues pop up. Um, and it's just a non-affirming space for people to get around and move their bodies and, and celebrate together and work together and, and have a good time. Um, so that stuff is cool. That's another one that's been going, that Lambda's been around for many, many years at this point. Um, and then we have Iowa City Pride, uh, which puts on Pride every year um, and since 1970. So there's been a Pride in Iowa City since 1970 when Gay Liberation Front was founded. And um, they continue to do stuff throughout the year as well with different educational opportunities and events and stuff as, as they arise and, and providing community support and resources for people. And this will, the exhibit will be up still during Pride Month, during June. So if you are not in town a lot, you're not downtown a lot um, and you're interested in seeing the exhibit and you're like, oh, well, I'm gonna go downtown for Pride should also come see the exhibit. I will just plug that. Um, it, it will still be up at the time that Pride is happening this year. Okay, and then we have um, the like basically like a AIDS support organization. So there were two uh, major instances of this in Iowa City specifically, which is ICARE, and it stands for the Iowa Center for AIDS Resources and Education. And then there's the AIDS Coalition of Johnson County. Those are the two major ones, and they were. Neither of them are in operation now. Um, since the the main epidemic has kind of eased and they found ways to uh, manage uh, HIV and AIDS diagnoses, right? Um, but this was uh, ways for the community to support itself, offer resources and educational tools for folks who were working with people with HIV and AIDS in Iowa City at a time when, as I said, a lot of government officials were not even recognizing it or saying the name, right? Um, including the president at the time at which uh, AIDS was really exploding. Um, so it, it's, we have a wealth of materials on this topic as well from uh, the Patricia Herring papers in Iowa Women's Archives. So if you're interested in this topic, that's a really good place to look um, for some more information there um, about AIDS and, and Iowa City's response to the, the epidemic. And then I believe this is the last organization is Lesbian Alliance. So as I said, 
when it's talking about Grace and Ruby's, Lesbian Alliance is um, a community organization. It basically was a, a branch off of the Gay Liberation Front um, organization, I think partially because they wanted something that wasn't strictly uh, university affiliated and because they were noting that there wasn't the direct addressing of women's issues that they were wanting as lesbian women. And so there was this split they still worked closely together. They had like dances and stuff in, in conjunction with one another all the time. Um, but they were in operation from 1973 until the early 90s. And they, in addition to once Grace and Ruby's closed, basically, um, and after kind of the flack that that got from the Human Rights Commission, um, they were like, well, we still want a space that we can gather outside of like the male gaze and, and, and really support each other and one another's creativities and needs and things like that. And so they developed this women's coffee house, which was, you paid a fee, you got to use the space. Um, there was like pool tables and things like that. And as a gathering, gathering space. And um, they kept it kind of on the down low. And so it was sort of a word of thing and they would they would maybe leave flyers and in, in very like specific and strategic places like the Women's Resource and Action Center or RAC, right? Um, where more and more women are gonna see it, but it kind of kept it sort of very, very down low and grassroots. Um, and so that was, that was in operation for a few years as well um, as a meeting place. And we have this iconic picture this with the apron of my dreams here uh, that I just, I adore so much. And I think it's, it's very feminist. Like, you know, it's very much of that movement of uh, disputing the inherent nature of uh, inherent gendered nature, quote unquote, of domestic labor. So I really appreciate that. Okay. And then we have the other community spotlight. So in addition to the Iowa City Kings, the other community spotlight is on Stephen Allen Carlson, who is a more recent um, acquisition, papers acquisition that the University of Iowa Archives received. Um, he passed away in 2020, I believe. Again, pregnancy brain, please excuse. Um, but he was a, an Iowa born man, lived in Iowa his whole life. Uh, he was a prolific journaler and an uh, amateur photographer volunteered with eye care, um, worked at Hy-Vee for a long time. And, and he, so he was in and around Iowa City basically his whole life. Uh, he's also a University of Iowa alum. Um, and so we've been lucky to get his papers because it's a set of journals that spans from like the 60s into the 2000s. Um, and to have that kind of long lasting perspective from a gay man in a kind of set sort of area isn't super common necessarily. And so to see from that perspective, like the evolution of uh, gay rights over time and how he navigated gay relationships um, and, and gay rights movements and things like that is really powerful. And it's very like, it's very moving to see, you know, the like the humanity of it, and especially with his photography, um, we, there's like these sheets of of little Kodak slides, um, and there it, it'll just be like a mishmash of things within a different sheet. So it'll be like, okay, here's an artistic picture of some peas, right? And here's people hanging out at a backyard barbecue in like very '90s clothes, and here's a dog, you know. And so to see kind of those. Um, those like a little insight into his mind <clears throat> of what he found beautiful in a given moment is really, really uh, it's kind of emotional at times. It's, it's very moving. I, we said the annex where I work stored a lot of his materials. And so I spent probably too long looking at those slides when I should have been shelving it. Um, but I definitely suggest that if you're interested in uh, that kind of uh, specific perspective um, over a long period of time that this is a good place to start. And because it's a new collection, we're trying to uh, get people to know that we have it and that that's a chance to, um, to do some research as well. Or creative work, you can get inspired by his photography. Okay. And then the last thing we have in this, this is a lot of it's based in Iowa City, but some of it spreads outside of Iowa City specifically into more statewide um, scope um, and that is uh, queer publishing. So the we start 
this like sort of panel on publishing with the Iowa City Women's Press, which was founded in 1972 because of a uh, university press that refused to print a, uh, like basically diagrams for a self exam, a self pelvic exam. Um, and a lot of uh, lesbian women, uh, a lot of people that would end up being involved from the lesbian alliance were like, we can't do this, right? We need to be able to distribute these materials so people can um, have safe relations with their bodies. And so they set up a printing press and the printing press actually ended up printing uh, quite a few of these publications that we'll talk about as well um, until it basically got priced out in the mid eighties. Um, so that's sort of the press, um, the actual publications. Um, first one is RFD, which is a journal for rural men in and started in Iowa and Grinnell. Um, and it's like a place for, you know, seeking ads. Like I know somebody in our community that was like, oh, I put a personal ad in this issue, right? Um, and to talk about different uh, topics, politics, health concerns, and things like that that were happening at the time um, while having that kind of Iowa perspective um, and, and an awareness of like the issues of rural gays and rural uh, gay men specifically. We also have issues of Better Homes and Dykes, which was the newsletter from Lesbian Alliance. Uh, you can see uh, the top left image there is a cover from one of the Better Homes and Dykes issues um, in front of ha good old Hamburg uh, downtown uh, with some little corn outline, which is great. Um, and that, that went for several years as well and was from the Iowa City Women's Press. Iowa City Women's Press also printed RFD for a while. Um, then we have Access Line, uh, which was a statewide publication that was basically born out of the need to spread information about the AIDS epidemic. Um, and so it was a chance to, in a state where if people don't uh, really assume that there's much of a gay population, um, because we're not, you know, in the Midwest in general, that's an issue, but besides like Chicago, um, but uh, especially in Iowa, that's, it tends to be an uh, issue that's kind of overlooked. And so it was a grassroots uh, setup that for several decades ran uh, news about different political movements, health issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then the last publication, and this also was published by Iowa City Women's Press for a while, is Common Lives, Lesbian Lives which is a chance for lesbians from all over. I was printed in late because of the press. It was printed in Iowa City. It started in Iowa City, but um, people could submit from all across the nation, creative works, personal stories, um, different articles and, and artistic pieces and things like that. And what's fun is we have a, they printed a little set of spinster card game. And uh, we had some of that included. You can see that in the bottom picture. And that's a really fun item from Iowa Okay, so that's the like community stuff. Now, as going back to the initial goals of like wanting, like addressing gaps and noticing gaps, we wanted a chance to, for people to add to the exhibit and add to the archives to try to bring more nuance and diversity into our holding. Because we know there's not enough representation of people who are asexual or aromantic. There's not enough representation of people who are queer or trans in the BIPOC communities. There's not enough representation of trans people in general, um, or polyamorous folks, things like that. So we wanted a chance for people to bring their voice into the equation to help improve the exhibit as it was up. Um, so this is our interactive component. So you can see here, there's like some little prompts on the side. And then there's also some contributions, which I, sw I swear would, especially with being pregnant, I cry every time I look at the new ones. Um, and so it's a, it's a chance for folks to add their voice and to add their perspective um, about what's good, what's bad, what they you know, wish was better, um, what, what makes them happy, you know, just even what they think is beautiful in a given moment. And so it's a chance to, for them to contribute and know that their voices are important and that they, they deserve to be heard. Um, it's also a chance for us to add nuance to the, an exhibit that inherently doesn't and can't represent everybody, both because of the space limitations, but also just our archival holding limitations, right? Um, and it, what will happen with these is at the end of the exhibit, with like permission and, and all that stuff, uh, folks, it will be stored at the University of Iowa archives. Um, so that will 
be available the next time somebody's wanting to do research on LGBTQ communities, now they'll maybe have, you know, they'll run across this folder of these and be like, oh my gosh, this one's talking about asexuality at this time, right? Uh, this one's talking about trans issues at this specific historical moment. And that can, you know, be a whole other wormhole for some nerd to go down, uh, which would be really fun. So there's a uh, chance to submit in person with the little, um, there's little sheets and a pen. You can write things on submit, or I believe Sarah, yes, Sarah put it in the chat. Um, you can submit online as well. Um, and it can be anonymous. You can put your name with it, whatever feels uh, most comfortable. I would encourage you to do that. Um, all stories are important and matter, and we want to try to represent those as best as we can. And so that's kind of the takeaway that we want people to have is, you know, help us grow our archives, appreciate, you know, appreciate what we have, obviously, um, but then uh, constantly looking towards who's, who's missing and how can we improve those, uh, improve those gaps and fill those gaps. Here's a little credits list. Check out the exhibit if you haven't yet and are able to get there in person. If you have any other questions and want to email me, uh, you can just look me up in UI Woods directory and I'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you, everybody.